What I'm really here for is to say thank you, a really, really big thank you to all of you who've made the sepsis sequence such a success over the last few years, because it's been up to you, not to us at the center, and you've made a real difference for patients. So what I'm going to talk about is sequins, and in particular the sepsis sequins, where we've come from, where we're at at the moment, and where we may go in the future. So just to remind people who aren't aware what sequins is about, it's the Clinical Quality Incentive Scheme, and the idea is to incentivize improvements in the quality of care for patients. Now, in an ideal world, this would involve giving additional money to an organization that delivers the goods. But given the constraints on resources in the NHS, what we're faced with in this country is that a small percentage of the standard contract money is actually withheld by the commissioner and then only paid if the targets are met. And they are targets in terms of the metrics. Um, we know from experience that if you try to introduce a sequin on something where only about 5% of people are already doing the thing, it really won't work. It's just too big an ask. So you need to be in a position where you've already got about 40, 50, 60% of providers doing the thing. Uh, and then you've got a good chance of pushing it up to 90%. And then the ambition is at that stage, you move the thing across into the standard contract and spend the sequin money on something else. There's also something about how many sequins you have at any one time, because if you're a hard-nosed finance director or chief executive of a provider organization, and you're being asked to do something that's going to take a huge amount of resource, and yet perhaps you're only going to get a very small amount of money in if you achieve it, you won't prioritize that. You'll prioritize the things where you can actually bring more money in, because they've all got to balance the books. We also know that you need a really good process measure that you use for the sequin, because you're measuring sequin performance in a year. You're not going to wait for two, three years down the line to see what the outcome is. And I think one of the best examples from the past was when we introduced a sequin for venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. And those of you who were involved in it at that stage will recall that it felt slightly odd, because what was measured was whether or not patients admitted to hospital were actually assessed for their risk of venous thromboembolism. They weren't assessed for whether they were given thromboprophylaxis or not, they were assessed on the risk primarily. But over a period of three, four years, it very successfully got the measurement of that risk up from relatively low figures up to over 90% around the country and was estimated to have actually saved quite a lot of lives from DVT and pulmonary embolism. So when we introduced the sepsis sequins, first of all, it wasn't my choice. Um, I wanted it, but I didn't have control. The decision about what's chosen for sequins is taken actually at executive level in NHS England and NHS Improvement now, and it's a competitive process. And so I had to ensure that with the sepsis board that I chair, we created something that was actually going to spark enthusiasm at senior level, be easy to measure, and so on. So while we were supportive of the sepsis six, we decided that we would pick just getting the antibiotics in quickly to people who are at high risk of sepsis as our measure. And in terms of the clinical assessment, when we started, we just wanted hospitals to set up their own system for how they identified who the high-risk people were. But as you'll be aware, a couple of years ago, it became apparent that News 2 scoring was a really good way to identify acutely unwell patients. And so what we developed was a sequin in which Anybody who scored high on News 2 should have a competent clinical assessment, which included considering, could this be sepsis? And then if you thought that it might be sepsis, those patients were then put into the pool where we measured how quickly the antibiotics were given. When we started the sequin, to make it simple, we just started in the emergency department, but as you know, we then extended that to include people who deteriorated on inpatient wards. And we had talked all the way along to our colleagues who were looking after the antimicrobial resistance agenda. And what we were able to do over time was to link the sepsis sequin with the AMR sequin, so that as you know, this year we have the reducing the impact of serious infections sequin. And that, I hope, would minimize inappropriate usage of antibiotics. So it's about getting the right treatment to the right person at the right time, and yet not giving antibiotics out willy-nilly. Um, and the risk was, we felt, that if anybody um, looked at this from a very superficial point of view, they might simply start giving antibiotics to anyone in ED with a high news score. 
and I've heard anecdotally that has happened in a few places, and that's not where we want to be. So how's it gone? Well, I can show you the data from when we started up until quarter two of this year. So this is the ED figures for screening. So people who were thought to be at high risk, how um, often were they screened for sepsis appropriately? And you can see that having originally been at about the 60% level, we got up to over 90% uh, at the end of last year, dipped slightly in quarter two of this year. And I don't know the reason for that. I'd be interested in people's views about that. But it's had a significant impact in terms of making sure that people are thinking sepsis and checking for it. Then in terms of treatment in the emergency department, we measured things slightly differently in different years, but again, you can see significant success getting up from the 50s up to over 90%. Then as far as inpatients are concerned, this started a year later. Looking for sepsis in people who deteriorated on the wards seemed to be slightly better when it started off at 65%, and that's now um, over 85% and still on an upward trend. And then treatment for inpatients, again, has improved over time. But you could say it's may, maybe it's plateaued, and it's actually between 80 and 85%. And that, um, that's a bit troubling. You know, if you think someone's actually got sepsis, you need to get the treatment in quickly. So I think there's probably more work to do uh, in this space on inpatients. But overall, it is a significant success. And then when we joined it up with the day three review, you'll recall the day three review, review is intended to look to see the people who are on antibiotics to see do they need to continue them or not? Are they on the right antibiotic? Could they switch from an IV to an oral to minimize inappropriate use of antibiotics? And the 72-hour review over time, the blue line at the top is whether or not the 72-hour review was done, um, going from 2016-17 up until um, the first two quarters of this year. You see it's lying in the mid-80s. And the lines below show what was done. And the red line is stopping or changing the antibiotic to, um, uh, to oral or changing it to an, a different antibiotic. Um, and then the green line at the bottom is stopping it altogether. So you see 20% of people who were thought to have sepsis were started on antibiotics. By three days later, it was established that they didn't need the antibiotics any longer. So that's well worth doing. So from that point of view, thank you very much, everyone. You have done a fantastic job. In the last two years, the sepsis sequin and the reducing, inappropriate, uh, reducing the impact of serious infection sequin have been the most successful sequins of the entire sequin program. So I'm really, really pleased with that. So where do we go going forward? Well, what else did we learn? First of all, there was a little bit of uncertainty about what constituted the denominator, particularly in the emergency department, because emergency departments had the opportunity to exclude people from consideration if they thought it was obviously something else. So if someone's got a high news score, but they've come in from major trauma, it's likely the major trauma that's given them the high news score. Or if they've come in with a heart attack uh, or whatever. At the other end of the spectrum, if someone has come in with a label on their forehead virtually saying, this patient is septic, some emergency departments excluded those because they, didn't, they, they wanted to address the people where they were uncertain about the diagnosis rather than the ones with a confirmed diagnosis. But the rate of those exclusions was really variable between trusts, and we've never quite got to the bottom of that. The second point on this is that the trusts with electronic recording of vital signs, especially the ones that then go on and tell you what the news score is, uh, and similarly, the trust with electronic prescribing and drug administration systems can do this without breaking into a sweat. They don't need the sepsis nurses to spend hours and hours and hours pouring through notes or the pharmacists doing all of that. And instead of submitting 50 patients a month samples for the sequin, they've actually submitted thousands and thousands, and in some cases now hundreds of thousands of patients. So if we can get to a position where we've got good electronic recording of vital signs, the automatic calculation of news scores, and ideally the automatic alerting to an appropriate clinician for patients with high news scores, this is a really good thing. And I'm sure people will also agree that where we get to electronic prescribing, we will actually help reduce inappropriate prescribing, um, clashes, prescribing in the presence of allergy, and so on. But also, we'll have timed 
records of the Drug Administration on the system, and that will make a huge difference. So please encourage your organisations to go down that route if you haven't already. And just from the sepsis sequin a sample population, over the last three years, we think at least 1,000 deaths have been averted from sepsis. And the data that we're starting to see show that more widely, beyond the sequin, the mortality from sepsis is falling. And that, again, is down to the good work that you're all doing. So, well done. So, where next? Well, the good news is this was considered to be so successful that it's been moved into the standard contract so that providers are expected to carry on doing these things and not send the data up to the centre in the future, but to do it and to assure it at board level in your own organisation. So we don't have a specific sepsis sequin for 2019-20. Now, the 1920 sequins have not yet been announced, but it is very likely that there will be something on AMR, something around um, prescribing and treatment in UTI, and something around antibiotic prophylaxis for colorectal elective surgery. I can't give you the details, they're not quite finalized, but look out for those when they come out. But we've also got an opportunity to design a, a sepsis sequin of some sort that will be of value for the year ahead. And as chair of the sepsis board, one of the things that we haven't fully addressed yet is source control. Now, I've got a background as a colorectal and general surgeon, so I've seen a great deal of sepsis where antibiotics alone will not cure the patient, and I've probably caused some of it as well. So what I'm talking about is someone who's got a big abscess in the pelvis that needs a, an a interventional radiologist or a surgeon to drain it. Uh, I'm talking about somebody who's got an infected, obstructed bile duct that needs an emergency ERCP. And there are several other examples of things that will not get better alone with antibiotics. And you end up giving people antibiotics, the wrong antibiotics often, for a prolonged period of time without curing the patient. So I think we've got an opportunity to do something for the year ahead. We've been told that sequins for next year are going to be uh, in a competition, as usual, and prioritised based on the criteria that I've shown here. The condition's got to be something that's significant that affects lots of patients. It's also got to be something where someone's tried this out and made it work in the NHS. So it's no good just thinking something up on the back of the envelope and submitting it this year, whether it comes from me or from you or whoever. You've actually got to have set it up, tested it at at least one hospital, and shown that this is measurable and works and doesn't add too much bureaucracy and doesn't have unintended consequences. There needs to be a straightforward and simple process measure, ideally based on data that's already available, so we don't go back to a situation where clinicians are spending hours and hours and hours poring over paper notes. And we also want it to be something where actually around half of trusts are already achieving the standard. So this is a really good opportunity and this is my challenge to you for the future. You've done such a good job on sepsis so far. I think you've now got an opportunity to design and test potential candidates for 2020 sequins in this space. And I think source control is a good place to go. If you look at the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit data, which are publicly available, you can see the issues about getting people who've got peritonitis to theatre quickly enough, where they need that laparotomy for their source control. If you look at the new document from the Royal College of Surgeons of England on the high-risk general surgical patient, you can see standards in there for times two source control. So I think there's an opportunity here for people to take something forward. And my last slide is not just thank you for listening, but thank you for going ahead and helping us with this going forward. Thanks very much.